right now, uh, we, we, you kind of have to be in the major meme of the market, which means the the metal price is, is moving up. So right now, gold is kind of the hot spot. And so when people approach me on anything other than gold, generally, unless it's an incredible asset, uh, we're, we're taking a, a pass on those. So gold stocks, uh, <clears throat> you know, the royalty space has obviously uh, always been uh, a, a pretty good one. We don't own any royalty stocks right now, but, you know, not having any costs when you don't know how your AISC is going to be, your all instantaneous costs is a good thing. So, <laughs> you know, they trade at a higher multiple for reasons, uh, but... Uh, the, the two that we own, one's called Luca Mining, one's called Caliber Mining. Keith Schaefer, how are you? Andy, I'm doing well. Thanks for giving me a ring and bringing me back into the space a little bit. You're very welcome. Um, we were texting back and forth. It's been about, I don't know, three weeks ago. And I remember you, I think it was, it was either 2007 or 2008, I met you in person at the uh, Vancouver Mining Convention, if you would. The VRIX is what they call it now, I think. So anyways, it was a very, uh, I enjoyed our meeting very much there. And uh, you, you were a very stand-up guy, which you still are. So um love to uh, see what you're doing now but also um see what your thoughts are on junior mining the mining sector and the drilling sector and um the good bad and ugly about that so yeah let's talk about the junior mining sector where do we begin and what's your issues and what do you look for in junior minings well right now uh we, we, you kind of have to be in the major meme of the market, which means the the metal price is is moving up. So right now, gold is kind of the hot spot. And so when people approach me on anything other than gold, generally, unless it's an incredible asset, uh, we're, we're taking a, a pass on those. So gold stocks, uh, <clears throat> you know, the royalty space has obviously uh, always been uh, a, a pretty good one. We don't own any royalty stocks right now, but, you know, not having any costs when you don't know how your AISC is going to be, your all instantaneous costs is a good thing. So, <laughs> you know, they trade at a higher multiple for reasons. Uh, but uh, the, the two that we own, one's called Luca Mining, one's called Caliber Mining. Um, Caliber just bought um, the asset in Newfoundland, the Valentine Mine, that they're going to be putting into production that we think has got a shot at getting a big re-rate uh, in early 2025 assuming that everything goes well here. You know, it's, it's just so funny, Andy, over the last decade, you know, there's been enough disasters on new mines that the street's no longer willing to bid these things up in anticipation of new cash flow, that they're, the street is now expecting there to be a, you know, hiccup or three along the way uh, in getting these things built. Plus, you know, the, the truth is that some of the feasibility studies, even the bankable feasibility studies, ended up being completely wrong. So you had some pretty big CapEx numbers get written off very quickly over the last 15 years. So this, that's why these none of these assets are really, stocks are getting any big joy until the asset's been producing for six, nine, 12 months. Um, so uh, we haven't really been looking at exploration side. Honestly, Andy, the older I get, the less time I have for the exploration side. <laughs> you know, I, I really think that our generation might have been the last ones that were the true interested investor ring around gold stocks. So uh, now gold stocks run because they get a big push. People can do a bunch of Internet marketing. And um, it's just really hard to see how much true interest in gold there is. Obviously, it's been going up a lot in the last few months as the price of gold has gone up. But again, the expiration stocks generally have been pretty poor. And, and and I think there's a a, a, a few reasons for that. Um, you know, there's, a there's a lot of companies out there, so you know I think the management pool gets diluted quite a bit. I, I would suggest humbly to investors that even on the producer side, management quality in the gold industry is much lower than other industries, certainly compared to oil and gas or uh, like industrials tech. Um, so, and on the junior mining side, it's 
even worse. So, you know, you've really got to have a great technical team backed by a great finance team. And those groups are few and far between, right? And right. and you've really got to stick with the guys who can raise money and find good assets in bad markets. I look at a group like John Robbins Discovery Group uh, as, as somebody like that. Uh, what the Hunter Dickinson Group have been in the past. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the other thing, of course, is the warrants. Warrants. Yeah, about that share structure, how important is that to you? Oh, it's huge. You know, you get a, a great deal out there that's might even have a good asset. But, you know, if there's 20 or 30 million warrants at 20 cents that don't expire for two or three years, you know, that that stock is in my books kind of DOA dead on arrival. So it's to attract investors still. So Canadians, this this is a horrible thing that Canadians have created for themselves because it really makes it difficult to um, see these stocks go because as soon as there's a lift in the stock, the warrants start to get exercised and it has to, again, the asset has to be almost a freak of nature for it to bring in enough buying that all these warrants get exercised and, and you can get past them. So, mm -hmm. you, and you've got to have an amazing drill hole. Like let's say if it was copper, it would have to be like 1% or almost 1% over hundreds of meters. Gold, you would need like half an ounce plus over tens of meters with two or three holes like that, you know, where, where people can volumetrically multiply the width, length and depth of an asset in their minds and kind of put together a bit of a resource. So the, the, the warrants have been a real drag and will continue to be a real drag on a lot of stocks. And I don't know that there's any way around that simply because, um, you know, you, you don't see a deal get done with no warrants anymore. We've ingrained it into our culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it, the inside groups have just got too greedy. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it used to be back 30 years ago, Andy, in the early 90s, when we started that, you know, liquidity and the amount of people who put money into these things was so small. And so you have like a company with 11 million shares out after a drill program. Well, they have to roll that back and make it 3 mm -hmm. million. Because there was just no, everybody would just sell all that stock and there was not enough buyers to absorb it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, nowadays, you know, you've got companies coming to the board with hundreds of millions of shares or tens of millions of shares with a huge, with tens of millions of founder shares, tens of millions of two and five and 10 cent paper, single digit paper. Uh, so you know, that just makes it so tough for these things to get any real lift off and give the average investor a real chance. Got it. I have a few questions and you just gave a lot and thank you for that. But a few questions on everything that you just said. Um, and I'm just saying this for curiosity so I can go do my own homework here. You say Caliber, is that correct? And Luca Mines? Yep. Okay. CXB and LUCA, yep. Okay, my first question, and I'm going to ask a couple questions before you jump in. Why did you like them? Was it specifically they're near near term producing or are producing, or is it the drill holes? Is the management team that sort of thing? And then you gave me an entire process, if you would. But if you can simplify that for somebody like me, what exactly? Some I'm coming to you to buy my mind. And I have, I literally have a hundred thousand people watch these videos and all of them are confused. They need to evaluate this mine. How does Keith Schaefer evaluate the mine? Cause I want to say nine out of 10 of them are going in the trash. Well, well you're talking about a producer. Like if you weren't, you yes. say, why, did you, why did you pick Caliber? Well, Caliber had, uh, you know, had really shown that they are, were way better operators than I think a lot of people gave them credit for. Their Nicaraguan assets have done really well and their uh, management team's done well. And so, uh, you know, they had the currency where they could go out and raise the money to buy the Valentine mine. And so, you know, I, I think the street's kind of given them a little bit of credit here. You, you've got that's a big step change in cash flow. That's going to be a fabulous mine if right. it works. 
So uh, it's in Canada. It gives them some diversification. So there is a big, big catalyst that could re-rate that stock within 12 months of me buying it. So, and of course we had gold at our back. So that like, to me, that was a pretty obvious big winner. Yeah. Potentially. Uh, Luca was kind of the same thing where, but for a year we sat on that, not really thinking much was going to happen. And then all of a sudden they started getting, you know, the, these mines closer to production grades were continuing to hold up. All of a sudden they had uh, a plan come into place where they could, uh, really increase production at Campo Morado, their, uh, big cash flowing machine. So between metal prices, uh, new metallurgy that reduced cost, uh, you know, the, this, this new mine at Taueto coming on board again, big catalysts that if all goes well, give investors a pretty good chance at a dramatic re-rate. And so, you know, we've owned that stock now for coming close to two years at 35 cents and it's only 45 cents. So that's not what I'd call a huge win, but they're putting everything in place to make it work. So, and they've brought in a new management guy who was from the street. He was an investment banker and he's just gone out and raised a bunch of money and got the stock trading above issue. So that's good. And so, but again, that that's going to be an early 2025 story as well. Got it. Now, um, your process then, you just gave that to me, but then I guess give me your, maybe the best way to say this is give me your your top three things that you're going to look for. It sounds to me a share structure, producing management. Would you would you say that? Yeah, but, but uh, 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 yes, but you, big catalyst. There's got to be a big catalyst on the near term horizon. Got it. Got it. Okay, that's good to know. Next thing is 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 it important to you if they're listed in the U.S. on the over the counter markets? Over the counter markets, I don't care too much about. Uh, certainly, in North America, a, a U.S. listing is better, but really, that's only for the producers. Whether it's if it's an exploration or even a, a development story, having it listed in the states is not such a big deal. I, I, I don't, I don't think that. It, but if it's a producer, yeah, you want to make sure it's listed in the states uh, as quickly as possible. Got it to attract U.S. investment. Got it. Okay. Um, next question. Let's um, pivot a little bit to uh, oil and gas. Why do you like the drillers more? Well, I think the whole uh, oil field services sector, uh, the frackers, the drillers, uh, are have been in a better spot. You know, they've they've borne the brunt of um, most of the cost cutting in the sector, certainly since COVID, but even going back to 2014. So now they become so efficient. Uh, they're still making uh, incremental improvements in how much oil they can produce per foot. So uh, and and the whole sector, just like the producers, the the oil and gas producers are now in a position where they don't want to grow, grow, grow. They just want to return money to shareholders. And the service sector is kind of in the same boat, where uh, they're not interested in you know increasing the size of their fleet right away. They want to milk what they've got and return capital, keep their debt ratios really low. So the whole sector has had a pretty big turnaround. But I, I just think that the, the services sector is now done with being the patsy for the producers. And so there's going to be a little more equitable um, distribution of profits in the patch to the services side. Got it. Good answer. I've actually had two recent guests on that are very heavy in their portfolios with service oil service companies, as well as as well as some producers, and they would share the same sentiment. And I do think there's going to be a drastic shift there, probably in 25, and for various different reasons. But that's interesting. Um, what advice would you give to when we first met again, it was almost 20 years ago. That was about 30. I was about 30 years old. <laughs> what would you give advice? Would you give to your 30 year your, your old self or myself then? Well, you can really waste a lot of time in the penny stocks. So again, you got to find the right groups. So you think that Ross Beatty's group had an amazing decade in the 2000s. The Hunter Dickinson had an amazing decade in the 1990s. 
you've seen uh, the Discovery Group with John Robbins have an amazing decade in the 2010s. So, you know, you, you want to, and of course the Lundin family has been consistent through all three of those decades. So, you know, picking the right jockey is as or more important than picking the right horse and don't let a cheap stock tempt you. Like I, I think, you know, the, the, the need for capital here is continual. It's high, it's voracious. They have to keep diluting themselves. And so um, it, it's just a tough place to be. So you want to just stay with the right people. Now, the market is big enough for everybody, that's for sure. So, you know, there's a lot of guys who are willing to go pick up stocks at a penny or two over the course of two or three years and accumulate a position in a shell company that's being ignored by a good team while they're focused on some other asset. And that's a very valid way of making money. Uh, particularly if you don't have a lot of capital, you just have to do your homework. But it's, uh, in my mind, a tough way to play. So if I was to go back, and there's been a big change too, like like smaller companies did have more appeal uh, back in the 90s and 2000s, and now they don't. So um, <clears throat> we've got um, we've got lots of too many assets, too many companies, and, and just picking the right ones with the teams that have uh, experience and the ability to raise capital. That's not always self-apparent. You got to do the work to find those. Yeah. Do the work. I would agree. Let's very quickly and briefly, well, take it out however long you want. Let's talk a little bit about macro here. What are you expecting here? And this is not a trick question, but it is tricky. <laughs> in the next three to six months, in both um, the metals or precious metals themselves, as well as um, in the uh, oil and gas sector, are you? Do you have any expectations? Well, in, in oil and gas, we're oversupplied coming out of Wazoo, so we've got six million barrels of spare capacity. Uh, the, the demand has been pretty strong. So I, I think I just saw the other day where they figured we, we were up 3 million barrels a day over the last 12 months. So uh, the hard part here is that with oil and gas on the producer side, lots of gas. Everybody in the world's got gas. Lots of oil, 6 million barrels a day of capacity. And, and, and it is a little bit concentrated in the Gulf, but... Um, there's lots of capacity, certainly in Canada. Canada has the ability to add another half million barrels a day of oil sands production pretty easily. And if, if the Conservatives get in the next election up here, that'll certainly happen. So it, it's tough to get really bullish on oil when you've got lots of spare capacity and gas is everywhere. And we're getting better and better at getting it out of the ground. So the cost of production is just getting cheaper and cheaper. So um, that's oil and gas. And then on the precious metal side, the street seems very uh, convinced that the US dollar is going to have uh, to come down as interest rates come down. And uh, there's certainly a case here that in the US, rates have to come down from the current five or just under five to probably around three to get to the Fed funds neutral rate. And that the street's betting that's going to be a big drop in the USD and a corresponding rise in gold. Maybe that's true. So mm -hmm. far it's working out. So, you know, you just try and stick with a good thing while you can, but um, there's so much more liquidity in the world and gold is re remarkably under owned both as a commodity and in the stock market. So uh, what we've seen here really is just the beginning potentially of what could be a pretty miraculous run that, unless you're my age, you might not remember in gold stocks. <laughs> or my age, I might add. Um, awesome. Excellent. Any final thoughts at all? Again, then that could be it. Um, I do appreciate that. But yeah, any final thoughts you give to uh, any new investors that are looking to uh, jump into this space? Well, what, what I, just on the share structure, what I, I always ask the, the teams when they come and they say, well, okay, we want to tell you about our company. I say, okay, well, before that, we, we even do that, send me the cap table. And I don't mean how many shares out. If, I mean, I want to know how much money and how many shares issued at every single price level all along the way for the last two years, minimum. Great and question. If, if they're not willing to send me that, 
then there's no meeting. There's no call. Like they, so they say, oh, well, there's this. So, all right, you send me this. You, you've told me now that there's 32 million founder shares. Okay, great. When, what, what's the release schedule for those? What, you know, what, what's the expiry date and strike date of all the options and warrants? Mm -hmm. Anything, are there any other convertible securities in the business that I should be aware of? Like that is just so important to understand. Because unfortunately, uh, four months to the day after a financing gets done, there can be a wall of stock for sale. Uh, and, and we're seeing that. So it's, you just kind of have to really, really be aware of all these things. Yeah, no, I agree. And I've uh, been on the other side of that <laughs> where I, uh, you know, I wish I had that advice at an earlier age. Um, Keith, I don't know if you're still doing business with uh, retail investors or companies, but if you are, how can the people get in touch with you and uh, look you up? Uh, the best place to go is our website, investingwhisper.com, or they can just Google Keith Schaefer. I will show up there with a bunch of other uh, Keith Schaefer's, but the investing one will only be me. Well, I say that because I know you're very, very picky. And uh, because you're picky, I'm very honored that uh, you spent this time with me. So thank you very much. God bless you, Andy. All right. Take care. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yep. Bye.